Through death, I will achieve what Sigmar, the soul thief, never could. I will have order, unquestioned, unending. And with that order, I will purge the chaos from the mortal realms. Do not deceive yourself, servant. My victory is inevitable. What is the ultimate weapon of war? Is it an item, like a hammer, or an axe, or a blade? Is it control and domination, being able to wield massive creatures at your disposal, or endless hordes of corrupted followers? Is it a place of significance, a castle, a fortress? What about time? Time itself. The Soul Wars are an opening act to the God of the Dead Nagash wielding time as the most potent weapon in the mortal realms. The story we're about to cover comes directly from the Age of Sigmar core rulebook, and it's going to be an ongoing story as this campaign unfolds. This is simply the starting point, but there's far more stories to be told. And to begin that story, we need to talk about its main character, and that is Nagash himself. Now we've covered Nagash in two videos previous, one way early when Age of Sigmar began, another one kind of updating it when the Legions of Nagash book and Malign Portents came out, and I'll leave a link to those in the description down below. To put his story in the briefest of terms, he was found by Sigmar during the Age of Myth. Sigmar assigned every god a domain of their own, and it seemed fitting to put Nagash over Shaiish. Interesting note that there are other gods of undead. For example, Mor is one that people might recognize from the Old World. Well, Nagash immediately upon hitting the scene on Shaiish, conquered and devoured every other god he could find, asserting himself as the dominant force of death. When Chaos started to poke into the mortal realms and really have a small but meaningful significance there, he betrayed the Pantheon. Sigmar was so enraged by this betrayal that he left the main battle against Chaos to go hunt down Nagash, wasn't able to do that, and went back and sealed himself in his ear. Nagash tried to fight off Chaos for himself, but was struck down by Archeon. His body was broken, but was kind of hurried away by Arcan the Black and Neferata, and brought to a little pocket realm, much like Alariel hid in, in the Realmgate Wars. The book Nagash Undying King follows his reawakening and re-strengthening, and from that moment he has started on a grand project to become the dominant force in the mortal realms. Now I want to pause here and talk about a resource that's very important to this story arc, and we'll come back to Nagash and how he plays into it in a moment. And the resource is called Gravesand. It goes by many names, but this is the one that Nagash tends to refer to it as. We'll be doing a deep dive into each of the mortal realms very soon. But in short, each realm is the embodiment of a particular type of magic, much like a Discworld if you've ever seen the art for it. Very stable magic in the center, extremely unstable near the edges. It's near the edges, however, that you can find an incredibly powerful and rare resource, Realmstone. It's called by a different name in each realm, but in Shaiish, where death magic is present, solidified death magic is called Gravesand. It's exactly what it is. It is the stuff of death made manifest in physical form. It's an extremely powerful resource. If you were trying to make your own RPG campaign and you wanted to have a mystical gem or something in a weapon to make it extra magical and powerful, this is the kind of resource that would make that happen. It imbues energies into whatever it is near. And as I said, it is literally magic in solidified form. So how does Nagash fit in with Gravesand? Well, here's the plan. The plan to take the mortal realms for the forces of death. He uses time, as we talked about before. The greatest weapon ever is time. After reawakening, Nagash retakes his home city of Nagashazar, his capital, his crown jewel of Shaiish. And he sets Arkan the Black on a mastermind scheme. You're going to send a whole bunch of skeletons out to the realm's edge, collect grave sand, bring it back here, and we're going to forge a ritual that's going to change the realms forever. Arcan openly says this plan will take hundreds of years. The magic in Gravesand is so potent that a skeleton can literally hold one grain of sand at a time. So it's going to take hundreds of thousands of skeletons moving like ants in a line, going out to the realm's edge, collecting one grain of Gravesand, bringing it all the way back. Sometimes it'll explode because the power is too great, and their skeleton has to go all the way out to collect that one grain all over again. This is a plan that is centuries in the making. 
the resources required to make this happen, not even the gravesand, just the logistics of all this, is immense. And Nagash's response is, well, you better get started. And all these events are starting to unfold throughout the Rumgate Wars. This is when Nagash is reawoken and he's kind of creating his own machinations while Chaos and Order are busy fighting each other. All the while, incrementally, the gravesand is going from the realm's edge to the dead center in Nagash's R. What this effectively does is it moves the concentration of magic from the outside of the realm into the center. It literally inverts how magic works in Shayish. So what do you do with Gravesand once you have it all in one place? Nagash begins construction of a pyramid. Several pyramids, but one great one. It is monolithic in size, jet black, and hovers above the ground upside down with the point of the pyramid facing the earth. This entire pyramid in vast size and scope is constructed entirely of grave sand, one grain at a time. And he's going to use this concentration of raw death magic as part of a grand ritual. The plan is to raise the dead in every realm simultaneously under his command. The hundreds and thousands of deaths on all the battlefields through the Age of Myth, the Age of Chaos, Age of Sigmar up to this point in the story, it's been hundreds of years now since the Rumgate War has started. The sheer amount of dead and dying would give Nagash an unbeatable army. It would just swarm and strangle life from the mortal realms. Armies would be not only created instantly under his command, but everywhere. Every town, every graveyard, every war zone, every battle site, all at once ready for war. And of course, as those vast armies start killing unsuspecting people, more dead are collected, more souls go to Shayesh, he gets more powerful and has more minions at his command. It would be swift and brutal, but it would very quickly assert him as the ultimate power in the mortal realms. A secondary part of this plan, this grand ritual, is to really consolidate Shayish. If you're not familiar, I did a video on Shayish itself. It's really, there's one giant plane that we know of from most of the stories. However, Shayish also has a bunch of kind of pocket and minor realms, pocket worlds if you can imagine them. In brief, we went into more detail in that video, but in brief, if a society exists anywhere in the mortal realms and they have a particular religious belief, let's say there's a Viking-esque tribe and they believe in Valhalla, right? When you die, if you're honorable, you go and you just get to fight for eternity in glorious combat. Their beliefs will create that kind of pocket realm in Shayish. So that when you die, you literally kind of create your own adventure with whatever heaven or hell or retribution you, your religious beliefs dictated. And over time, as societies dissipated or were exterminated and those beliefs fell apart, the pocket realm in Shayish would dissipate and you'd become something like a spirit host. What this ritual is going to do is suck in all of those little pocket realms, those little afterlifes that we have created throughout the mortal realms into one. There is only Nagash. There is only his death. There is only subjugation to his will when you die. It effectively turns off the afterlife of every religious belief simultaneously. It is a horrifying idea. Every time someone dies in the mortal realms, their souls are ripped violently and quickly away from wherever they were headed directly to Nagash through the Black Pyramid. This is also going to have major implications for factions that rely on manipulating the soul. The two most prominent ones being, of course, Stormcast Eternals, where Sigmar rips the soul from the body and takes it back to his ear before Nagash has a chance to take it into Shayesh. And, of course, the Eidneth Deepkin who raid and pillage souls that rightfully belong to Nagash, so they can propagate their race. And our story of Soul Wars as a box set, as a narrative, as a grand opening act, really begins when Nagash is almost completed with the construction of the Black Pyramid. He really just has the cornerstone to put on, the actual top of the pyramid. And before going any further, I want to uh, uh, say how detailed and oriented this plan it really is. He has taken lessons he learned from the old world when he did a similar ritual in Nehekara and magnified it beyond anyone's belief. His intellect, his power, and his discipline in the use of death magic has really gone to another level than anything was possible in the old world. However, when you have so much of a precious resource in one place, somebody else wants it. And that's universal across any of these stories. And here enters the Skaven. See, Nagash had plans for all four of the Chaos Gods. He knows them very well. He's watched them do their business throughout the ages. Again, Nagash uses time as a weapon. He's seen Sigmar and his soldiers fight and push back the darkness, but he knows their tactics well. He sees the soul thief for who he truly is. 
and he's been taking this time to really watch and learn. And he has defenses ready for all of these things, but the one force he really can't get a good grasp on is the Horned Rat himself, Chaos God of the Skaven. We learn through these books that the Skaven still love Warpstone. That was actually a question I had in my Skaven lore video. They were kind of vague about what Warpstone really is. Now we know it's basically just unaligned magic, the raw stuff of magic as well, just like Gravesand is, but not really tied to a particular realm. However, they do have an interest in Gravesand because it does give them power just like Warpstone does. And when you get all that Gravesand in one place, it becomes a prime target. The Skaven, in their arrogance, believe that they can sneak into Nagashazar and kind of steal and drive away with a giant black pyramid the size of a mountain, and the dullards of zombies and unthinking undead will never notice until it's too late. Of course, the Skaven have always been a bit more ambitious than they are practical, and they launch several colossal campaigns, all headed for Nagashazar. If you're not familiar with how the Skaven travel realm to realm, they use something called gnaw holes. They literally can dig through reality, going from one realm to another without the use of something called a realm gate. We covered this in the Skaven lore video. I'll put a link to that as well down below. What I said in that video, and I'll reiterate here, is that this is an incredibly unreliable means of transportation that is reinforced again and again and again. That's how they're not so dominant and overwhelming, not being able to be wherever they want to be all the time. One gnaw hole actually opens up in an ocean called the Catifer Sea in Shayish, and it literally drains an ocean. They dig into the murky, dark, oily depths of this water, and of course the ocean just literally drains into this colossal gnaw hole that was just made going back and starting to flood wherever this Gaven came from. And in doing so, they have set a series of events in motion that are going to drastically affect Nagash's plan. This gnaw hole draining the ocean, which was actually covered in a Malign Portent short story, reveals an Ijanath Deepkin enclave centered in Shayish. Now the Deepkin have relied heavily on mystery and mind wiping and secrecy to survive. And so when the ocean drains and they're just out in the open, they know Nagash is hunting soul thieves aggressively. There's actually a faction of undead walking around the Catifer Sea because they know something's happening here, but they don't know what it is. So the Deepkin here immediately go to see some allies in another enclave, and they come up with a plan. We have to do something. Nagash's eyes are just staring at our enclave, which is now abandoned, but he knows something's up, and that's not good for any of us. How can we redirect his aggression, his ire, to another opponent? And this kind of coalition of Deepkin come up with an incredible plan. What they do is they find a massive wah campaign of Iron Jaws, Oryx, really any kind of green skin, get them riled up, and start luring them to a certain point. This is actually also covered in a Malign Port and short story when the Deepkin were released. It has a unit of Akelian Guard running from an Orc Wa, leading them to a certain destination. And it's a flood of green skins just ready for war. While the Iron Jaws are chasing down this Deepkin, they fall into a pit that they couldn't really see. And it turns out one of the Ideneth Deepkin Tidecasters had opened a sort of portal that brought this flood of Iron Jaws from wherever they were straight to the doorsteps of Nagashazar. Rather than trying to hide their existence, they simply put a threat that's so big and imposing straight in front of Nagash, he couldn't look for the Deepkin. He couldn't waste the time trying to solve this mystery with the Iron Jaws right at his doorstep. And in this way, they throw a mountain of destruction straight at Nagash. While this is happening, the orc shamans are beginning to whisper in their dreams and communicate across the realms through prayers to Gorkamorka, and more destruction armies start flooding in. These are also things, all these little events that we saw, all these little short stories and malign portents are coming together because the worshippers of Gorkamorka are all being told the same thing. Go to Shayish. That is where glory lies. I want you there. And so we see these stories with Moon Clan Grots being led away by Shaman into Shyish. They have to fight the undead. Iron Jaws are flooding into the realm by the hundreds. It becomes the epicenter of the mortal realm's destruction. Now, all of these things Nagash would prepared for. Maybe not the Idnith Deepkin releasing a flood of orcs, but he was ready for a monumental war effort to stop him assuming that people would catch on to his plan. Of course, the distribution of grave sand going to the concentration that it was in Nagash started off a series of weird portents and signs all across the realms. Magic was already kind of in a weird place. People were having dreams and signs. The entire malign portents uh, campaign, the literal name of that is just that this disruption of magic through 
the movement of grave sand to the center and how it disrupts the realm really it alerted people that something was going on in Shaiish, and so he expected big armies to come and stop him so he was kind of ready for this and that's okay because at this point his project is nearly done anyway like i said right before the capstone goes on but what he didn't see and what he didn't see coming going back to our little skaven friends was that a clan eshin group had infiltrated Nagashazar. One of those many, many campaigns of Nahols actually landed where it needed to be, and the near undetectable spies and assassins of Clan Eshin made their way into the city, seeing the giant black pyramid. Now, looking at this thing, if you're looking at the pyramid, it does have a bunch of alleys and corridors, passageways, things like that inside. It's kind of like a catacomb, if you will. And so they infiltrate inside of it, thinking they can find some way to control it from the inside. And we'll just sneak into the pyramid and drive it away. It makes perfect sense. Thing is, once they're inside, they become incredibly disoriented. Like I said, this is the pure stuff of magic. It messes with their senses. There's false walls. Gravity seems to fluctuate wildly. So they're having a lot of time, they're having a hard time moving around this thing. And while a bunch of Skaven are inside the Black Pyramid, the capstone is put on without anyone knowing they're in there. And now they are trapped inside. Nagash, not knowing that his perfectly crafted ritual piece is now being infiltrated by elements of chaos, begins his grand ritual. There's no time to waste. The armies of destruction are at his doorstep. There's forces of order on the horizon. This is the time to get this going. As he begins his grand ritual, the Black Pyramid begins to spin. And what this does is it acts like a giant funnel and begins pulling in magic. So if you can imagine water being pulled into a drain, this is what it looks like when these afterlives and his myriad of pocket realms are sucked into the vortex that is the black pyramid it is a colossal battery funnel and siphon all at once and it is just ripping these realities apart it channels death magic to a singular location not only is it made of grave sand which already has disrupted magic across every mortal realm by creating these malign portents and signs and things like that but this process of ripping souls from the living so Sigmar can't have them, consuming the afterlives, things like that, it's bringing all that magic to a singular location. However, there's a problem. The problem is the Skaven inside the Black Pyramid. Now, they don't do anything specifically, any kind of action to shut down the spell, but their mere presence is a corruption to the perfect plans and designs and machinations that made this thing possible. There shouldn't have been anyone inside of it, let alone the mantic and frantic energies of a chaos skaven force. Because of this, the ritual does not go off without a hinge. It begins, the pyramid itself begins to spin at an incredible rate, very frantic, it begins to demolish several parts of Nagashazar as it spins wildly. It plunges into the earth itself. Remember I said that the point was facing down. Uh, one of the books said it was a hand's width off from the earth. So it's, it's pretty close to the earth itself. It goes tunneling straight into it. It's not a tunneling motion so much as it's bending reality around it. It's just kind of ripping away at the reality of the realm itself. Below the temple, a single point exists. Like we said before, we're channeling all the death magic. What this is doing is creating a singular point, which Nagash calls the Nadir. And this is it. This is like the center of a black hole, right? Where all mass is consumed into a single finite point. This is exactly what's happening with the energies of death throughout all the mortal realms. It's all being drawn here. That here place is called the Nadir. It is such a place of concentrated death magic that even Nagash can't stand there forever. Now I will say we don't know yet the full implications of the Skaven corruption of this plan. We know that it did a lot of damage to Nagashazar and kind of threw off his defenses. And there is a giant orc wall right out front of his doorstep, so that'll obviously matter here very soon. What we do know, however, is a few implications that happen from this ritual. Death becomes a prominent faction. There's so much power that Nagash has at his disposal that he cannot be ignored by anyone. By Sigmar, Gordrak, who's leading the Great Wa, any of the Chaos Gods, they have to deal with Nagash now. The core book also says that dead begin to rise in the thousands across the mortal realms. My understanding is that it's not the same as what he intended, that the Skaven corruption weakened his ability somehow. So my thought is, the dead rise not nearly in the vast numbers that he had wanted, but the plan worked enough, I will say that. He is now a prominent player in the battle for the mortal realms, and the soul wars have begun. This series of conflicts that deals 
with the very fabric of the mortal realms, how they function and operate, and what death truly means in a setting of unending war. Now there is also some more aftermath I want to talk about, because not only did this forever change death magic by moving the concentration from realm's edge to the center, by creating a vortex, by destroying the afterlives of every civilization everywhere, which is horrifying to think about, someone could literally eat your heaven, but it threw off the foundation of every realm. This vortex creates so much kind of magic in the air that the known laws of nature throughout all the mortal realms are changing in big ways. Usually when a wizard casts a spell, it dissipates very quickly. For example, if you're a Wurgog prophet, you can do the Fist of Gork spell or the Foot of Gork. They have a few options available to them. And a giant green foot will come down and literally stomp on your enemies and then it will dissipate off as the magic kind of gets ripped away to the realm's edge. Well, now there's so much magic in the air that spells are not being diffused like they were. They're not going away. They linger now because there's enough energy on the wind in the realms to sustain them. And this introduces us to the supplement known as malign sorcery. Now when a wizard casts some spells, they gain a very small amount of sentience and just tear through the realms as if they were just a wild creature. Simply because the stable formula for how magic works in these realms has been decimated by Nagash's ritual. And so to kind of wrap up this first opening act of the Soul Wars, let's talk about where we are right now in the story. Death is Ascendant. Shyish is the focus of every major faction, but the war has now come to every mortal realm. Nighthaunt have risen in thousands, Nagash appoints leaders, a new Mortark, we'll talk about her soon, and the Soul Wars begin, a battle of undead versus everyone. The Stormcast, Eternals, the Deepkin, really any type of the elven factions that were pulled from Slanesh, right, where they manipulated the souls and kept them from Nagash, any of those factions are now in trouble. Really just meaning anyone that Nagash perceives as a soul thief has a target on their head. In addition to that, the living essence of the mortal realms is now at war. Nagash wants to rule it. Everyone else fights for freedom. The grand plan here is just to kill everyone. When everyone's dead, Nagash can just control them and there's no foothold for chaos. And this kind of shift in dynamic, this change in storytelling of good versus evil, and now there's this third party who everyone's kind of against, is going to be incredible because it's going to make some unwitting allies. I mentioned in the last story of the Rumgate Wars, there was a scene where it was Stormcast Eternals versus Chaos, and there was also an Iron Jaws war going on at the Maw Gate. And it gets this interesting point in the story where a Stormcast would kill a Chaos guy, which would then help a Iron Jaws guy who would stand up, stab the Stormcast, which would accidentally, inadvertently help a Chaos guy. And this kind of madness of war would ensue between three parties. Well, now we've just opened this up to all four parties, meaning destruction, order, chaos, death. But all three of those other factions, destruction, order, and chaos, are trying to stop Nagash. His plan has to stop more than anyone else's. So what kind of situations are these factions going to find themselves in and moving away from that strictly order versus chaos narrative is going to invite a lot of incredible stories and i cannot wait to share them with you i want to reiterate this is just the story coming from the core rule book nothing else but you will see a lot of content in this playlist as this narrative progresses so thank you so much for watching if you like this video please consider subscribing thank you so much for watching and happy wargaming.